What we're talking about now is in the perioperative patient, specifically the IV iron products. We're going to break down each product. Um, we're going to talk about them and the reason why you need to know a little bit about two of them and why we'd like you to know a lot more about the third one. Uh, what has been happening in the region as transfusion has been reducing is obviously the use of IV iron has been increasing drastically. We don't know for how long we're going to be able to do services such as iron infusions for GPs um, in the hospital, meaning have them come into the hospital for the iron infusion because of um, uh, ABF issues that are transpiring. If they're not scheduled for a surgery, for example, in the very near future or a procedure, then we don't know how much longer we're going to be able to do that for the public patients. Um, so therefore, uh, Pradeep will be covering the success that he's had in his clinic regarding IV iron infusions. And we just happen to have a drug now that is just ideal for the clinic setting um, for iron infusions. So let's talk about the different things. We've already talked about the different lab values that you would want to have in order to assess your patient's needs. We've talked about the difference between absolute and functional iron deficiency, and that's still in your handouts. We've talked about the different ways or the different things that can influence the ferritin in an upward direction, and we've talked about the different indices and how they can be altered according to different conditions. So let's talk about the history. Again, we want to make sure that you emphasize these different questions with your patient because that would be for example, in the acute care setting, we would take these into consideration as to which product that we would be using for intravenous iron, depending upon these type of answers, and we've already gone over this list earlier. So when we break it down, as of this year, we have three different IV irons in Australia available for use. They are all different. There's a misconception out there that one IV iron is the same as the next. You use the same dose as you do from one product to the next. Every one of them is very different. Every one of them has different side effects. Every one of them has different reactions or allergic potential. It is the outer shell of the molecule that they're actually uh, having the reaction to. It is not the iron, which is the central core of the product. So therefore, you need to understand that there have been some some clinicians who were new to the IV iron world and went ahead and ordered them the same way that they had done other drugs in the past, other iron products in the past, and that's, that's potentially dangerous. So you, that's why we want to make sure you understand the dosing is different, similar but different, uh, the frequency in which you can give it, the when you test for their lab results to see if it has made a significant impact is different, and we're going to try to break that down just briefly for each one of you. First of all, we want to clarify, many times a patient will say, well, I had a horrible reaction to that drug. There's a big difference in adverse events in iron products. The first level is, of course, the most emergent, and that's the anaphylaxis or pre-anaphylaxis phase. I put the asterisk next to the hypotension just this morning because in one of these IV iron products, if you give it too rapidly, you actually have hypotension, which is an oversaturation. But in your setting, you're not going to be using that particular product. So I just want to make sure that you understand hypotension can occur in some products because of the way that you administer it. But otherwise, the tachycardia, the wheezing, the strider, or the periorbital edema are the early signs of a serious life-threatening reaction. The rest is sometimes referred to in the literature as the Fishbane reaction. That is um, named after Stephen Fishbane, who uh, essentially did the first set of studies on what is the allergic reaction and what is just adverse events. These are the typical myalgia, arthralgia, metallic mouth, headache, mild rash, or low-grade temperature. Those are the common ones. These are the ones that don't necessarily need to be treated. As long as the patient is forewarned well in advance before they accept the idea of an IV iron, they need to be told that these are common occurrences. Not every patient has an adverse event, but these are the most common. 
and in the particular drug we're going to talk about more so than the other two this afternoon, headache is the most frequent uh, event on this particular uh, intravenous iron, which is the carboxy. Okay, these all resolve without treatment. Sometimes we tell patients that they got a mild rash to go ahead and use an over-the-counter cortisone cream, something to that effect. So just mild treatment is all that's necessary to reverse these. And if you also forewarn them in advance, I've had the, some elderly patients in the past that didn't understand the muscle aches and pains that can occur and how many days into post-infusion it can occur. They thought they were having a major heart attack, they went into the ED, things like that. So you really need to counsel your patients accordingly. So who is the candidate for IV iron? It's the oral iron failure patient who we talked about earlier today. It is the first trimester of pregnancy and women who present late in the course um, in other words, the first trimester, IV iron is not recommended, but the women that come in late into their third trimester, that oral iron is not going to do much of anything for them other than make them fairly miserable. It's also people with intestinal malabsorption, inflammatory bowel. Uh, John Alnick just talked about how oral iron is not the drug of choice for these patients. Ongoing iron loss. Um, Michael talked about a couple of patients that he's had in the past that require very frequent IV iron, and a clinical need for a rapid iron supply. That means the patient who's going to surgery within the next two weeks, maybe even a month, that needs IV iron and it readily available and accessible for erythropoietic activity after blood loss. Chronic renal impairment or cardiac failure. These patients, some, there are some hospitals since the literature came out in the last five years around the world that are doing every six months having their cardiac patients come back into clinic to have their iron stores assessed. And if they fall below a certain level, they get IV iron and then they go home for another six months. Gastric bypass patients also are another candidate. Uh, surgical intervention bypass patients. They usually require anywhere from every six to eight months to every 12 months one infusion. And so that's another category for these patients. We do not recommend IM iron, which we've talked about several times today, so we won't go into it. But what we're going to do is break down these three different products for you so you can understand. Iron polymaltose Australia is quite unique, and they use this product. The only other country in the world that we know of that still uses it is India. It is very, very cheap. It's probably the cheapest iron I've ever heard of anywhere in the world. It's $4 per 100 milligrams, and it really is incredibly fairly safe. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, it's very old, it's out of patent, and it works well for Australia, and so it's still on um, most hospital formularies. It was the primary IV iron up until 10 years ago, I think, Venifer came on board. I've got a date here somewhere on one of my slides. And in the meantime, iron polymaltose has been the uh, IV iron source drug of choice for a long time in Australia. You can give a total dose infusion, even though the literature says you can give up to 2,500 milligrams at one sitting if you need to by your math calculations and by their iron deficiency anemia. We usually don't recommend over 1,500 at one sitting before the patient can be reassessed and come back. It used to have to be delivered over five hours but thanks to some colleagues uh, in Australia, they did a study and showed that over an hour and a half you can deliver the same amount and it's just as safe. And so that's what most of the hospitals in the area have gone to is one and a half hour infusion. It is a dextrin, not a dextran, and it has uh, been since the 60s, 100 milligram doses in dialysis or a 500 milligram infusion in most renal patients. Retrospective, the safety is very good. It is not as good as some of the others, but it's still very good. Has a little bit higher allergic reaction rate than the other two products, but nothing like what the old iron was 30 years ago. Post-infusion side effects, 25% delayed self-limited side effects. I've heard of some people having adverse um, symptoms up to 10 days after the infusion. Study in 100 uh, patients of polymaltose, they were given 1,000 to 1,500, given over 75 minutes, 
experienced mild to moderate adverse events during the infusion, and one in 20 experienced chest pain. So that was it on iron polymaltose. We, it is still the drug of choice on inpatient care um, in the hospital for acute illness, uh, only because, number one, because of the expense. Number two, it's a little more accessible, readily available for erythropoietic activity than the other two, within the carboxymaltose, I should say. Um, but if there has been an allergic reaction in the old days when we were using polymaltose, the majority, then uh, it is not the drug of choice because once they've had a serious allergic reaction to polymaltose, they will continue to have even more so in the future. Iron sucrose, otherwise known as Benifer, is the most widely used iron in the world in the acute care setting and also in diabetes, um, excuse me, not diabetes, in pregnancy. It has been the most common drug um, internationally used. The, um, it is $13 per 100 milligrams, which doesn't seem too bad, except for the fact that you can only give 1,000 milligrams within one week, but you, can, you have to break it up into anywhere from three to five infusions during that week. So you cannot give it total dose infusion. Uh, in the United States, we've been known to use it as much as 500 milligrams over four hours if it was a really serious case, maybe a Jehovah's Witness, for example, who was profoundly anemic, life-threatening anemia, and, uh, but we, we didn't do it as a routine basis. The most that was being given at one time was 300 milligrams. It is a great drug. It is very um, minimally used in Australia mostly in the renal insufficiency and failure population, which is what it was licensed for when it first came into the country. That was, and Europe has been using it longer than anyone. It was licensed in 1950 and in the U.S. in 2000. Um, it, renal indications is what Australia labeled it for. And for any patients who, when it was licensed, it was for any patients who had had a polymaltose allergic reaction in the past. And for dialysis, it's still obviously still being used. It's life-threatening ADEs were 0.6 per million and deaths of 0.1 per million. Um, before coming to Australia, I'd been uh, working with patients in um, intravenous iron for about 10 years. Yeah, and I only saw one anaphylactic reaction in all that time between dextran, which you don't have here. It's similar to polymaltose, but not exactly and it was in a Venifer patient only because she had had reactions the first two times, early reactions, she didn't tell us about them. The third reaction was a full-blown anaphylaxis. So the point is, is communication with your patient, asking them what were your symptoms for the first 24 hours after you got home, how did the next two weeks go, um, and recording what they say that they've gone through and how they felt is very important for prevention of any events in the future. We still recommend um, iron sucrose on the outpatient side in some of our tertiary centers if we have a small window of opportunity to get things kick-started. It has a five-hour half-life for each dose that you deliver, which is the shortest half-life out of the three irons available. Granted, you cannot give the full 1,000 milligrams with that dose, but at least it can sometimes, you can sometimes break it up into a partial dose for the first infusion, then follow it up with a longer acting uh, product. Our third choice, ferric carboxymaltose, which is the one that we want to focus with you folks mostly. It was uh, PBS price just came out in June. We've been using it for over a year now with a contract with the manufacturer, but now we have a PBS price, which is $30 per 100 milligrams, which we're very happy about. Uh, sounds like a lot of money. But when you think about what's going on in our different uh, hospital bases, where there's very few chairs, very few opportunity for infusions for any length of time, the turnover of each patient for that appointment has to be very rapid. You can get a patient checked in, um, history obtained, signed forms, poke them in the arm, administer the drug, monitor them for a few minutes, and out the door in an hour to an hour and a half. So that's very beneficial to the hospitals, and therefore we felt on an outpatient side this was the drug of choice for our infusion centers. 
Comparison with other IV irons. Injection site, all similar. Injection site reactions, headache, hypertension, dizziness, vomiting, and diarrhea. Lower rates of hypotension and taste disturbances and higher rates of decreased phosphatase. I'm going to talk about hypophosphatemia in just a second. And the um, actual allergic reactions related to events uh, were very, there's been very few reported. Uh, I think, well, last time we talked with um, South Australia, they had had one, one or two events, and, and BAMLs had one event here locally. Now, these were questionable whether you want to call them life-threatening, but they were serious enough that they needed to have emergent attention of some kind. And that's out of quite a few um, infusions, so it's very, very low. So we're talking about 8.1% or 2 out of 1775 in one study that were serious events, potentially associated hypersensitivity reactions. We're down to 1.5 with rashes, urticaria, and wheezing and hypotension. That's compared to 1.5% of the comparative different products. So here's a graphic. I'm always a little confused as to why pharmaceutical companies compare an IV product to an oral product, but this, that's what these symptoms are compared to. So your pale green, which I don't even know if you can see in the back, but it is in your handout, is in ferrous sulfate, and the dark green is the ferric carboxymaltose on the percentage or the rate of reaction. As you can see, the headache is the top one on uh, carboxy, and then we'll talk about the hypophosphatemia down there at the end on the decreased serum phosphorus in just a second. What is it? Well, all of us at one point or time during illness or different medications have a lowered phosphorus level. We just don't know it. It goes in waves. It's rapid, comes and goes. We don't even maybe think about it because we don't have a level being drawn on us. <laughs> and because the circadian rhythms, uh, if they're drawn first thing in the morning, for example, in the hospital, your phosphorus is always going to be a little lower than later in the day. So normal level, 2.5 to 4.5, mild 2.5 or 6.65 to 8.81, moderate 1.0. The reason why I'm even bringing this up is because the other two irons do not list hypophosphatemia as an adverse event or a potential adverse event, but ferric carboxymaltose does. Is it important to the outpatient setting? Well, I've put these slides in your handouts for your information, but the bottom line is that if it's going to be serious enough to treat, you're already going to be sick enough in the first place and in the hospital. So it's in the acute care setting that this largely happens to the point where you would need to monitor it and potentially treat it. The candidates that, um, let me find the candidates here. These are the drugs that induce hypophosphatemia already. So the only thing that, for example, Catherine Robinson and I talked about this uh, back several months ago when we were working with Pradeep's clinic on setting up standards for this, um, we talked about, well, who, who would be the candidate that you'd be concerned about administering this drug to? And what it boils down to is, in her opinion, she feels that the only patient she would even think about maybe pursuing this with on checking levels and monitoring how they do very closely is in those that she's giving this carboxymaltose to several times a year due to chronic different issues. These categories also put them in a little bit higher risk, so therefore these might be ones that you think about as well. So in the hospitalized patient, how often does this occur? 2.2 to 3.1 percent in the research that was being prepped in order to um, license this agent in its trials. Patients at higher risk were alcoholic, septic patients, malnourished patients, and diabetic ketoacidosis. Again, these were all acute care patients. They were not walking around outside in the clinic. So there's little evidence that moderate decrease in blood phosphorus has significant clinical consequence. The exceptions would be in the acute care patient population. Aggressive IV phosphate replacement is unnecessary, even in those. 
Um, there was one case on the East Coast of somebody who was having bone marrow disturbances and sepsis, and they gave IV iron to, and they could not reverse the hypophosphatemia, and that's, we were consulted at the Department of Health about this one case, and that was over a year ago, when very few cases were um, even reported. So, what are the symptoms? The symptoms are, back here I have them listed, dizziness, bone pain, and proximal muscle weakness. Well, that can be some of your adverse events or the uh, symptoms of any IV iron infusion. So again, um, I just felt that I needed to tell you about it, whether it's, it, it, there's not been any reported cases that I'm aware of through the company stating that this is a serious issue uh, because it is resolvable usually on its own. So how do you do the math on the dose? Um, Ganzoni calculation is still out there. It's been used for the other iron products as to what the potential required amount of milligrams are for that given patient according to their hemoglobin and their weight, et cetera. In this particular drug, it's much easier if you don't use the Ganzoni than if you do 20 milligrams per kilogram once you have defined their iron deficiency with or without anemia and then do your calculation. But keep in mind, you cannot give over uh, 1,000 milligrams in one week. So you can do your math calculation and then have them come in once every seven days until you have filled that quota of that calculation that you think that they need. Each one of these infusions, the actual infusion itself is 15 minutes, but um, Pradeep is going to cover all that in detail as to their experience on the outpatient side. Some people say that under 70 kilograms, just keep it to 500 milligrams for each infusion once a week until you meet the calculation. And others say over 70 is 1,000, and then others say just do 500 at a time and see how they do. So there's, I know that sounds very, um, vague, but it's a very safe drug, and so that's why there's some flexibility in the dosing uh, that is necessary. And these are on your handouts as well. The safety testing back in 2011, this was used in the UK before it, was, it came here, and so we have some history on it. It's probably been published more uh, with this product release than just about any other IV iron on the market. Here's the differences in our three categories. How soon can you see the end result of each one of these products? Iron polymaltose, 21 days, everything's done, all your numbers have finished fluctuating, your stores should be stabilized, and whatever effect you had on the RBCs are complete. Venifer, it can be as close as two days after the last dose. Ferricarboxymaltose, it can be up to a month, okay? but. I've heard a lot shorter time periods. It's just that this is how long it takes to shift through its different phases and settle itself so that you could reassess whether there needs to be more delivered or not. And again, the same thing on this one. And the frequency is comparison of three. So what are the wait times in WA in the public health sector? I pulled this up this week and looked to see what the mean wait times were and so this gives you an idea of the fact that carboxymaltose for the outpatient setting is a reasonable time frame. That one month sounds like a long time, but when you look at these wait times, this is how many days is the average mean waiting time for these different specialties. And unfortunately, with all IV iron, you have the same thing. If you don't have a good line, you don't have a good insertion, if you have any leakage into the outer tissue, you get tats, and they stay. Um, women especially are not real happy with this result, and I've never heard of anybody being able to get rid of them once they're there. Looks like a real good tan, <laughs> that's about it. IV iron counseling, very important that the patient be well aware of why you're needing to give this drug, what the risk factors are, what the effects are, et cetera, et cetera. There is a pre-established routine in WA, and I've never quite been able to understand why, is avoid strenuous exercise after the infusion. Never quite can get my head wrapped around why that is, 
Um, if you're going to have any kind of a serious reaction, it's going to be within the first few minutes of the infusion. In fact, sometimes even faster than that. Um, the only thing I can think of is because you don't want to conflict the myalgia and so on and so forth with any hardcore, um, they must mean bicycling across town or doing something that would contribute to that issue. And also post-infusion issue, there are some clinics that say keep them for a half hour after the infusion, others don't. As long as you've given the, inf the handout to the patient after the infusion as well regarding contact your doctor if this happens, this happens, this happens, this may be a typical uh, reaction that you have effect of the um, agent, so on and so forth, go to your local ED if you experience X, Y, or Z. And then usually it's also beneficial to have the dosage written on that piece of paper in case they do feel they're sick enough that they need to go in somewhere. They can take it with them to the ED so the doctor who's treating them knows what they got and when they got it and how much. So this is just anecdotal. This is from a number of nurses that I know that have been hanging IV iron for a very long time of things that they have seen transpire, and not just once, but more than once, as to early signs of a reaction. And one is sudden GI distress where the patient literally starts complaining that I, I just have this horrible, horrible stomach ache and I'm going to have horrible diarrhea in a very short amount of time and that's a vagal type response and they can have an allergic reaction shortly thereafter. Bradycardia, for some reason, nobody knows for sure why this occurs. It does happen in some patients. They're not really symptomatic. They're just severely bradycardic. You turn off the iron and within an hour they return to normal and nobody's quite sure why it happens. It's very strange, but it does happen. Hypotension usually only happens in the iron sucrose category because it's the fastest acting one and it's usually just a matter of turning down the rate and then re-delivering it. But in carboxy, I've not heard of this effect. Uh, tingly feeling is another description patients give. They just kind of feel kind of tingly all over and that's the best they can describe it and that's usually one of the earlier signs. Uh, patients with pulmonary embolism history might be at higher risk of an allergic reaction, might not. History of frequent allergic reactions to meds. In other words, they give you this list of allergies and it's, you know, 10, 15 different drugs. I would say avoid polymaltose, but carboxy and iron sucrose are probably fine. So what about on the preoperative side? We talked about this list earlier today about the different categories in which IV iron might be used in your preoperative workup to make sure that there's adequate iron stores. And this is the kind of numbers we're talking about that you're going to see. I had the Department of Health pull up how many in the last year, how many open heart surgeries were performed in the public health sector, how many total hips, and how many total knees. And if you add all these patients up and you take that 50% statistic that I gave you earlier today, 50% of these patients were iron deficient, 25% of these patients were iron deficient, those that were iron deficient were also anemic. So we're talking about a fair amount of iron uh, being necessary for just the public health sector, let alone the private. So that gives you an idea of the kind of numbers in your region that we're talking about. So Michael talked about EPO and the needs um, for iron stores being available, but what we keep forgetting about is that's not just the injectable EPO, it's the EPO that we all produce on a daily basis. So what happens when you're going to surgery? If you don't have adequate iron stores, meaning more than normal, um, you have blood loss, obviously, during one of those cases. Let's say you have 125 hemoglobin, and you've got a 25 ferritin. And you go to surgery, you have a total knee replacement, and you lose 500 to 1,000 to mils of blood. The very first thing that happens is that your hemoglobin drops, and you kick out a tremendous amount of erythropoietin almost immediately. And with that demand that erythropoietin has, that you've just increased your rate, almost doubled, sometimes some literature says tripled your rate of erythropoietin production, you have this huge demand for iron that is available right now immediately in order to make those cells erythropoiesis adequately. 
So what happens? Your hemoglobin now drops at a much faster rate beyond what your blood loss was because you're sucking up that last little bit of iron that's left in your system everywhere. And what does that mean? That means that the doctor is that much more likely to transfuse because you're not bouncing back right away. Your numbers stay down for several days and they say you're not turning around so therefore we're going to have to transfuse you. So therefore you have to have those iron stores beefed up and ready for use. So the timing of the surgery for your treatment protocol is essential. Is this patient going to be on a waiting list for one year? Are they going to be on a waiting list for six months? Are they going to surgery in four weeks? Obviously, one category may need an oral iron trial, but the other one's going to need IV iron in order to treat them adequately. So therefore, that's why the drug of choice on the long-term wait would be carboxy. But in the short term, if it was less than a month, I'd say polymaltose or iron sucrose. But that, again, would end up having to be conferred between you and the hospital at that stage. So remember that erythropoietin production increases when blood loss occurs, okay, which increases the demand for iron. Elevated hepcidin levels, which we talked about earlier today, restrict the use of oral iron. If um, I've had a couple of different um, hematologists in the U.S. <laughs> that have said if you need to be treated with IV iron for iron deficiency and anemia, a one-time dose of B12 IM is not going to hurt, it's going to help in your process. But that's a particular choice on your part. They also feel that anything with a lower than 350 B12 level is not adequate in, a, in preparation for that type of erythropoiesis and cell production. Red blood cell production requires iron accessible due to the immediate need during acute blood loss. Kidneys probably don't have effective erythropoietic production during post-pump trauma recovery time zone. What I'm talking about is in the cardiac population, they already are going through a little bit of an uh, insult due to the open heart surgery and the pump use, the cardiopulmonary bypass pump, and therefore the erythropoietic activity may be even more blunted due to that. So why not have them tuned up prior to surgery so that they've already got those stores available and ready to be used. If a patient says, I'm allergic to iron, you need to go a lot deeper than just, I'm allergic to iron. You need to say, some people think that because they got constipated or got a stomach ache from oral iron, that means they can't take any iron, when in actuality, there's no connection between oral iron and IV iron when it comes to reactions. Um, so therefore, you need to do some digging. How many years ago did you get this IV iron if they said it was in a bag? and they had to sit for five hours, that's a good indicator, it's probably polymaltose. If it was prior to last year, it was also probably polymaltose. So therefore, carboxymaltose across the board can be tried without, there's no connection between the two really, and therefore you might run into another reaction, but it's not, it's not there's nothing in the literature that says that you cannot go to carboxy next, okay, as your next drug of choice. Uh, and we've done it multiple times for patients in the hospital. Um, other than that, there is also the consideration, for example, in the United States on dextrans, we use methylprednisolone. So that's something you can think about in the back of your mind if this is a patient where you're really fearful that they might have a reaction due to their history and previous allergies. And so you could consider that, but that's your call. And that's it. Thank you.